Why did the Borg cross the road? Why? Because it assimilated the chicken. Shut up, Wesley! Good morning, evening, and or afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and assorted things. I am Bill Allen, a.k.a. the guy in the red shirt, and this is the final frontier. Uh, I'm soloing this one today, so uh, being the lazy slacker and unorganized guy that I am, I'm going to skip the question of the week this week. And since there are some uh, scheduling conundrums, we're not going to post any news because whatever we say might not be news by the time we say it. Um, and I know that all of you out there listening would much rather I had skipped that joke of the week instead of skipping the other stuff. But you're stuck with it. So, since I'm soloing the show, let me introduce my very special guest here to talk about his new audio drama, Adam Mullen. Well, good morning. There you go. There, there's the good voice. <laughs> now, this is the same Adam Mullen who... Um, you also host a, uh, a, a a little podcast called The Final Frontier, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, so for the last few episodes, not the, last, la not the immediate last, but in several episodes where we're talking with people, um, a lot of the guys who've been doing these projects have also uh, – what else are you working on? Well, I'm working on this one that I can't talk about yet. It's finally time to talk about it, and that is – a call to unity. Yeah, <clears throat> my uh, my audio drama. Now, this first episode was the uh, the prequel. It's not the main correct storyline. It's just introducing the characters and getting a feel for it, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, now that we're finally at a point where it's like, well, we can't talk about it. Now you can talk about it. So, um, give us give us the rundown. Well. In this episode, the, our prequel episode, also known as Prologue, uh, it's set about 12 years before the main events uh, that we'll get to in episode one uh, in, in the next episode. But it, uh, the prologue revolves around um, the very last events of the Dominion War for like the last year, year or two of it, uh, which maybe is most of the war. Uh, oops. Uh, but it... It, uh, it starts off with, uh, I don't want to give away too many spoilers in case you haven't heard it, but it starts off with uh, with our main captain uh, getting captured by the uh, by Vorda and the Jem'Hadar. And actually, uh, this captain's name is Quentin Swafford, and he's, he's an actual character from Star Trek D Space Nine. We don't see him, though. Uh, we only hear him mentioned by name in a couple different episodes. He's supposed to be like this this good friend of of, uh, of Cisco's, and uh, off the top of my head, uh, I can't remember the episode name. It might be Far Beyond the Stars by uh, by uh, written by Mark Zekri. Uh but I think in that one uh, he he's mentioned as being uh, lost. Like, uh, you know, he was ambushed by, like, a squadron of Jem'Hadar fighters, something like that. And uh, he's, he's presumed dead. So I took it upon myself t to, to basically resurrect him. Because uh, what if he wasn't killed? What if, what if he was simply just captured? So uh, that will be a major plot point in the rest of the audio drama. Uh, how he was captured, why, what happens to him... Uh, so in the main part of the audio drama, we'll have these flashback scenes uh, with Captain Swafford and seeing him uh, be tortured, uh, how he deals with that, the ramifications, uh, and how it's uh, what it has to do with the with the main story, which is 12 years after he's tortured. Uh, so that that should be hopefully kind of cool. I, I kind of took cues from uh, if you've ever seen the show Arrow, uh, based on the uh, the DC Comics character Green Arrow. They uh, for the first five seasons they had these flashbacks where Oliver Queen uh, he gets stranded on an island and he becomes this really 
really this amazing, just like, well, not amazing, but, you know, killer, uh, and how that happened, and then his journey to becoming the the superhero that we know in the in the show. So there's some parallels to that. Although Quentin Swafford's not not a superhero, he's a very flawed man. Can he use a bow and arrow? Well, that's a good question. I don't <laughs> see why not. But uh, we we don't get to see him, uh, you know, use a bow and arrow. In, in the audio drama, sadly. Yeah. Now, this was was originally going to be was this originally going to be a um, a regular uh, video series? You were doing this. <clears throat> this was as a fan be, film. Uh, th- this was going to be yeah a fan film. It was going to be a feature length fan film. I wrote it in 2014, uh, and then the guidelines came out, and I went well. I guess I'm not doing that. And then through through the last couple of years I've I thought about it off and on how excuse me how I really wanted to do that but how would I how would I do it uh could I adapt it into two 15 minute you know episodes or or films and with with what I have and it, it just it would have really it wouldn't have worked so I thought, well, how, how could I do this? How could I tell the story I wanted to tell and not change anything? So I thought, okay, I'll turn it into an audio drama. That seems like fun because the last couple of years I've been listening to off and on uh, different Star Trek audio dramas like Excelsior and Outpost uh, and a couple others. And I thought, you know, that's that's kind of cool. I think maybe maybe I'll try adapting my feature-length film into an audio drama. And uh, there was actually a challenge with that. Uh, I I wanted to do several different episodes because I had about 200 to 300 minutes worth of content, um, depending on the two different versions of my original script that I had. Uh, depending on what was possible to do, what wasn't. And um, so I, I broke it down into about roughly 10, 10, 10 minute episodes, roughly, uh, while I was conceiving of this audio drama. And I found that what I had originally written uh, wasn't working the way I wanted it to for, for the audio medium, because a lot of the film was very, very visual. It takes place right after the destruction of Romulus, as seen in the um, the movie Star Trek from 2009. So I know there's probably a lot of people that'll be like, oh, you know, those movies. But I actually thought just that bit of Romulus being destroyed, although really like, like you know, wow, you know, how could they do that? Um, it actually opened opened up a lot of story opportunities, storytelling opportunities, and I thought, you know. There's something about that. So that's uh, that was the main inspiration for my audio drama. You know, how do the Romulans deal with now being basically refugees, losing their home world? What happens to them, and how does that impact the Federation? Uh, and so uh, my story, the main events of it, take place about one year roughly after. Um, the supernova destroys Romulus. So it's about the year 2388. Have you, um, have you, do you, do you play any, uh, Star Trek online? I do, or I did anyway for, for a while. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, cause I know they, they went a similar route. They used yeah. that, uh, supernova event as a starting point for yes. their of course. They, they went kind of full blown tinfoil hat space paranoia and, yes that and pretty much everything else bad that had happened over the last hundred years was part of a sinister Iconian plot. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, is is cool that they did that. Um, but mine is definitely not that it's there. There's, there's some elements of that in there. Not, not the Iconians, but, um, just kind of like the sinister plot going on. Right. Uh, You're, you're focusing more on what happened to the, the Romulans. Yes. Not, Uh, who did it to them and who's really behind it all? Well, 
it, it's not the focus is not about the supernova. There's something that happens in my audio drama that happens to the Romulans as well as um, another group of very similar uh, green blooded people, and it, it's all about you know connecting them as a people. So spoiler, spoiler alert: uh, there's this virus that infects um, the Romulans on Raytor Three. Uh, by the way, Raytor Three is um, a reference from the animated series, um, and then it gets somehow spread to the Vulcans. And so it's all about these two people coming together uh, through two main characters, uh, a Romulan and a Vulcan, uh, both female. And it's about you know them uh, sharing this really deep connection that goes beyond anything. And uh, it, it's about bringing together these two people because I thought you know the, the storyline from TNG unification with Spock, um, and his you know, his underground movement for unification was really cool, and I I always really wanted to see more of that, uh, which is it's it's discussed and shown a lot in the um, the continuing uh, uh, books that um, I used to read. I used to read those like all the time, and then I got too busy the last couple of years. I haven't caught up, but um, I thought you know, uh, seeing Spock again in that start in you know, that 2009 movie. Uh, you know, the, what happened to that to that movement that he was leading? Um, you know, he was able to to communicate with the Romulans, you know, and try to save them. So, you know, he wasn't necessarily hiding anymore. And I thought, well, maybe there was something that came of that. Uh, maybe they maybe his movement they came out into the open, which is what happens in the uh, in the books. Um, so I, I wanted to continue that storyline as well without Spock, of course, because it's. You know, after he's he's disappeared, um, or they you know presume him to be dead. Uh, yeah, does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. That's that's. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> this is not your first. I mean, you've. I remember people have mentioned you 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 you've done a lot of music for other fan films. How many other uh, fan films, fan projects, audio dramas have you uh, done prior to this one? Um, I would say, you know, I, I, I haven't caught, um, I have, oh man, I haven't counted. Uh, I've done several for Vance Major, um, and I've got a couple others in the works for other, other people um, that I can't say yet. But, uh, Mostly for Vance, okay. um, and then uh, now you know I wrote the music for this audio for my own audio drama. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, because um, you do you do music, it's like those other projects you're working on. You're doing music, or are you doing characters as well? Uh, just music. Just music. And that was the same for this one. I don't remember hearing your voice when I listened to. Uh... My voice is in it. It is. Yeah. Who are you? So, Who are you? And why did I miss it? Uh, so I, I don't, I don't like to credit myself for any, for, for that type of stuff because it's, you know, I, I always get embarrassed by my own voice. So I, I don't know why I do a podcast. <laughs> uh, uh, it's the there's this bridge officer that um, says, you know, bridge to Talan, uh, you know, we're, we're approaching Romulus, and it's it's during the scene where Talan is is basically um, she's reflecting on her her past experiences and um, how they've shaped her into the, the her current situation, uh, which I don't want to spoil that, um, which is the plot line that will come in later um, into into unity um, much later. But uh, I, I have it's just one one line and it's me because I didn't want to cast anyone for it because it's like, well, I might as well sit here and record it. And there, there will be a couple other times where I do that um, in the audio drama, but it's nothing special. <laughs> okay, that's that's the, so, so I wasn't I, I I heard the line, but it, it just didn't click because it was just yeah, so. I was like, okay, who's this character? Who's that character? Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, now I ask whenever we've had other people who've done audio dramas, um, I've asked them if they find it more challenging or less challenging to do audio dramas because you don't have to worry about visual effects but at the same time you have to use sound 
to tell the whole story. Now, mm -hmm. you have a background that is sound-oriented because you music and everything else. Mm -hmm. Sound is, is it like a key component for what you do. So was it easier for you doing an audio drama, or was this like a whole new experience for how to use sound that was a little outside your previous uh, bailiwick? Well, you know, the, the editing of it, I left to Trey Narr, who uh, did a lot of editing for Vance, uh, and Trey is amazing. Uh, so I left that up to him. I In the script, I have what sound effects I want, um, but uh, I, I said just, you know, go to town. Do what do what you want, basically. Um, so so yeah. it's very easy. You had somebody else yes, do it. Yes, it's very easy. I mean, I you know, he would send me what it sounded like and I would say yeah no whatever you know uh, I knew what this I knew what I what I wanted in my head it was it was I would say it was more difficult trying to do an audio drama because I wanted to do film with my with my project defiant stuff and recently Vance and I decided that we will go the route of audio drama just because it's it's a lot less time consuming um, well it, it's still time consuming but it we don't have to worry about uh, you know, getting everyone together to film. We don't have to worry about film dates, about if the studio is available, what's going on with the studio. Um, so this is just, it, it's a lot easier on the logistics side of things. Uh, but in terms of, you know, the visuals to sound, you know, I, I really want visuals. And, you know, like Gary Davis, you know, with his audio drama um, in, you know, uh, with uh, Dreadnought Dominion, although that's film, you know, he does a lot of, visual type stuff with his with his audio and you know i thought about that but i was like ah, it's just one more thing to have to you know do and um i'd rather just get this out there it's not you know like the prologue is like less than 12 minutes long it's really not that long to sit there and just listen to audio and i i kind of like the idea of letting the listener imagine it you know however they want without the aid of any visuals going on I kind of like that because it really brings it back to, you know, what audio dramas were um, on the radio, and that's kind of what I'm what I'm trying to emulate, uh, but just with Star Trek. Now you said your original script was about 300 minutes of content, which you're breaking up into episodes. Is there is is there is this a um... Is this like a, a serialized story with a specific beginning, middle, and end over several episodes, or is it open-ended so that if things go well, you could keep cranking out future episodes? Both. So, yeah, I, I had about 300 minutes or so of content uh, originally. And it's funny because earlier in this recording, I said when I adapted to audio, I didn't have enough. <laughs> so maybe that that's kind of confusing, but let me explain that bit. Um, I added a whole entire new storyline to the audio drama with the Klingons because um, I thought, you know, why not? That would be really interesting. I want to see what they've been up to, you know, since uh, since Nemesis. Well, even before that, because you know we don't see them in Nemesis if you don't count Worf. So we haven't really. We, we, we don't know what the Klingon Empire has been up to since the end of the Dominion War. Uh, so that's a whole new storyline. Uh, and then when I was adapting it, um, you know, I, I had to figure out, okay, how does this gel with my current storyline? Can I make it work? How do I make both interact with each other? Uh, that was really difficult, but I think I've made it work. We'll see. I'm still in the process of editing uh, my last five or so scripts. Um, just to make sure that it does indeed work. Uh, but they're all written, just need some editing, some polishing. Uh, so in terms of how the, the episodes work, uh, each episode basically flows right into the next. Uh, there's very little um, like time jumps. Like it, it, Some of the episodes, it's just seconds um, after the last episode. Uh, in the story itself, there are minor time jumps maybe of hours or days to facilitate uh, going to warp to somewhere uh, so that that's really that and I I conceived of this idea uh, about probably over a year ago I want to say at least of how I would tell it 
I know it was before um, Star Trek Discovery um, said that they were going to do like you know serial serialized chapter by chapter you know like each episode flows on the next i know i thought of it before then but when that when they announced that and they you know they uh, were discussing what they were going to do that that did probably influence me just to kind of refine what i was thinking so i was like oh yeah that's that's kind of an interesting idea that hasn't been done really with star trek whereas i mean if you don't count like the arc in Deep Space Nine, the, the last season, you know, with the, the last, like, eight or so episodes, or you don't count season three of Enterprise, um, you know, I'm talking about where each episode truly does flow into the next one. There's really not a break in story. Uh, so I, I really wanted to try that. Uh, and, and in terms of leaving it open-ended, uh, my... I have eight main episodes and then a prologue and epilogue planned right now for Unity. And it will definitely wrap up everything. But uh, with any good epilogue, there's always some some new questions that pop up. Uh, and it's, it's of a more grander story arc going on that I've, uh, I've, I've kind of interspersed in the first, if you want to call it the first season of Unity. You know, if we ever get to a second season, that depends on if people like it, if the, the cast and crew want to keep working on it, if I want to keep working on it, because this might take a couple of years to finally finish. So, but there, I always like to keep things open ended with my storytelling, just in case. Give us a uh, rundown of the characters. Oh man, there's there's a lot. Um, it's kind of like a mini Game of Thrones thing, if you want to think of it that way, but with a lot less death. <laughs> for now actors for now. keep this in mind he is the creator here you know he has power <laughs> over you well yeah people die but you know it's it's not it's it's like in regular star trek if you want to think of it that way uh the, the the heavy inspiration is from deep space nine so take that that clue as you will um but um in terms of characters so we have Cap, you know we have captain swafford and uh, he's not the typical captain because in the main storyline, it's, you know, it's present day 2388 and yeah, he has a lot of baggage. He probably shouldn't be in command of, of this ship. Um, but somehow he was cleared for duty and he, he is a good person. He wants to do right. Um, uh, but he's so deeply flawed, uh, both just like mentally just because he got really messed up from being tortured being held by the dominion um you know he he wants to do the right thing though and he'll go to really great lengths to do that and i don't want to give spoilers what happens uh and then his first officer is uh commander galway and galway is very by the book he's he's young uh he was thrown into you know, this kind of command, um, and, you know, being a first officer, you know, early on, which we see in the prologue, uh, a series of unfortunate events, boom, 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 happen, and he's thrust into this, you know, position of, of command, and he's like, oh, okay, but he, he rises to the occasion really quick because he is a smart guy. He, he's, he really is made for command, but he is so by the book to a fault that he is willing to, uh, you know, to look past the bigger picture and uh, do what he thinks is right, and that so he and the captain will butt heads. Okay. Uh, um, now, when the captain, when you say the captain will do whatever it takes to do the right thing, are we talking um, a Captain Kirk do whatever it is regardless of the rules, or are we talking? one of the more evil captains who breaks the rules for the greater good, but he's the villain because he's opposing Picard. He, he He's not a villain. He definitely is a, a, a good guy, if you want to think of it that way. But he's very flawed. Uh, that, that's what I'm going to say. You'll, you'll see. I, don't, <laughs> I, I just don't want to spoil too much because I like surprises. Yeah. Now, um... I know you've you've seen a lot of fan films and you've done the Trek audio dramas. Did you ever have any interest in the old uh, radio serials from the 1940s, 1950s? Honestly, not really. 
growing up, um, I thought it was an interesting form of storytelling. And now as someone who's been creating an audio drama and other stuff, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate that stuff. Uh, it's, it's really unique and an interesting form of storytelling. So now I appreciate it. Now I, I like it. Okay. So this wasn't the kind of thing where you, you wanted to be, you wanted to do your Orson Welles war of the world's radio play. You, you're finding I, out about that stuff now from Star Trek is opening up a whole new universe for you. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, 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 I knew about that, you know, I, I, I knew all that type of stuff, but I didn't go out of my way to necessarily like try to listen, you know, and enjoy it. Uh, but now, yes, this has this has opened up my my mind. I went into this thinking, okay, this is my my way around the guidelines. But now it's like, oh, I you know I I actually really appreciate this this form of storytelling now. So uh, speaking of guidelines, um, hypothetical situation. Five years from now, three years from now, whatever CBS says. Yeah, we're just going to forget about the guidelines. Don't worry about it. Go back to making fan films. Um, would you – now that you've done it this way, would you, are you going to stay in the audio format or would you do some kind of uh, like a holiday special where it's a video – like do just one mm -hmm. film? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think it might be fun to do a film that would be based on Unity, but – or, you know, continuing it. But I don't know. I, you know, now knowing that there's so much that goes into creating a film, it, that that's just like a headache that I want to avoid. I would rather do something that's totally different, uh, maybe connected but unrelated, really, you know, a new story. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do right now with um, my XCV 330 uh, fan film, which stars Andre Martinez, who also plays – my first officer in unity and uh so that's, and that's the I, one that's based on the uh the 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 sublight pre-starfleet uh enterprise enterprise that yeah. uh nasa's vision of what the ship of 2050 is going to look like yeah so that that one's also unique different i'm taking the cue from Vance where, you know, he has people talking on screen, you know, to each other through monitors. This uh, is, is similar. It's kind of a one-man show. I wanted to keep it really minimal, uh, really easy to film because, uh, again, it's, a, it's about the story. So it's uh, – I don't – see, I, I like surprises. It's, it's a series of log recordings uh, that Andre's character makes, and – it's about survival um, at the same time exploration by accident and it's um, it has to do with like this um, this experimental uh, warp drive that they adapt from Vulcan technology and I'm kind of taking that from other like other sources in Star Trek like through um, if you go to memory beta and you type in the XCV 330 uh, you'll get the uh, where, where they put it into their their wall calendars, which are pretty cool, and it gives a little blurb about you know if I remember right, you know it was a Starliner, and then it um, somewhere in it mentions about having experimental warp drive, and it looks like a lot like like a Vulcan warp drive. Um, so I thought I wonder if there's something there that I could tell um, using one person on this cool ship pre-Starfleet uh, and make it hopefully a somewhat emotional experience uh, in under, you know, 15 minutes, uh, something that's unique. And I, I think that's what, what, what we're doing. Uh, Andre's filmed um, a couple of scenes already, and um, he's going to have to grow out his facial hair. Uh, so it's going to take several months between filming different scenes. Uh, but it, it should hopefully be cool. You used to do work for Vance Major. Yeah. You've, I still do uh, work for Vance Major. <laughs> okay. Not that that's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, 
You got X- XCV 330 in the works. Mm-hmm. Call to Unity is out now. The first episode is out now. Are you uh, working? I, I, I... Do I have anything else? <laughs> well, um, what about? I mean, how how far along are you on the next episode? Is this the kind of thing where you've okay. already got most of it done and you're just pacing the releases like one a month or something? Yeah, that, or that was my original hope to do, uh, but this takes a, a long time to edit. And you know, thank you, Trey. Uh, uh, Trey puts in a lot of work and uh, even though it's under 12 minutes it takes a while to do uh, and so episode 1 the actual episode 1 uh, is is in the early stages of being edited together uh, I don't want to put a date on when it will come out but my hope this is again this is like not a final release date but I'm hoping by June um, and I really when I when I originally envisioned this, I was hoping every three months uh, for a new episode. But again, this is this takes a while, uh, and you know it probably would go faster if I had other people editing you know each episode because I'm I'm sitting on about uh, three or so episodes worth of of recorded lines that my actors and actresses have have sent me. So uh, you know if I had people who were just as awesome as Trey, um, it would be a lot, probably a lot uh, sooner. Okay, okay. So you do have, you have chunks of it already recorded. It's just a matter of uh, adding the effects and finishing yeah. it off. Okay, yeah, okay. so like all of episode two is recorded. I might be, you know, waiting for a couple lines here and there from people, but basically, you know, everything uh-huh. is recorded up to episode four. Uh, it's just a matter of getting it you know, sewn together in the editing stage. And um, how many episodes are there going to be in this first season of Call to Unity? Well, if you count the prologue and the epilogue as episodes, there will be ten. There will be eight main ones that will be, you know, uh, I don't know, between ten and twenty minutes or so. I'm not quite sure because this is new to me, um, you know, how long my script pages, you know, translate into minutes um, cause in film it's about a minute, a page. Um, this is a little bit different. Um, so yeah, there'll be, there'll be 10 episodes. Okay. And then cool. if people want more, I already have a story in mind that would be season two and, uh, it would be building on this in certain ways, but it would be drastically different. And there'd be a few surprises in there. Cause again, I like surprises, but what I mean by <laughs> this is I mean like, the kind of surprise that would make you go, oh, well, I didn't see that coming. Or, oh, that's a character that I remember from blah, blah, blah. So you are going to start incorporating uh, more um, actual characters and not just – because you said your captain is based on a, a name drop in Far Beyond the Stars. Yeah. Um, do I, you have any um... – So I do have uh, – off the top of my head, I have one character that we've seen in Deep Space Nine, TNG, a Klingon character, uh, who is a a side main character in Unity. Um, he's definitely very vital to the plot. He's a bad dude, uh, and uh, so that that should be fun. I I try I don't want to use characters that are well established. You know, I, I, cause I feel like I can't, I wouldn't be able to do those characters justice. And to me, it'd be weird to hear someone else's voice playing those characters. And I, I'd rather just use mostly original characters that I've created, uh, because I think that that creates a, a more unique story, a better story, a more storytelling options. Um, uh, cause I don't want to keep rehashing, you know, what Picard has been doing all these years, um, even though, you know, I, I have my own ideas and I've read the books, um, you know, I, I read, you know, the, the prequel comic to the Star Trek 2009 movie so many times, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't need to tell that. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, I know you're, you keep saying, well, I can't really talk about it in detail, but can you at least give like what are the names of the other projects you're working on? I mean, is there anything you can tell us? Well, I as of yesterday, I started 
writing uh, a Stargate audio drama, uh, which I really wanted to keep like secret for a little while until I have it ready uh, to start casting for. But uh, this is something I've been wanting to to do for a long time. Originally, you know, it would have been uh, like a fan film, a Stargate fan film. But, you know, as I've said before, I'm finding that doing a film is just, man, it it is difficult. You know, props to the people that that do them, you know. Yeah. Uh, It's so challenging. I I would love to do, you know, to do a lot of films. Uh, But the story that I had in mind, uh, I don't know if you're a Stargate fan, but uh, I wanted to really kind of continue and wrap up the storylines presented in universe atlantis and sg1 uh and originally my my idea uh was to use all of those original characters uh but i was like you know that's really complicated and again i i can't do those characters justice i don't want to use different people playing them you know and of course i can't get the original people um although that'd be so cool uh so i adapted uh, my my idea into um, it would be a cast a, a very minimal cast of new characters and the other character you know the original characters are there or you hear about them but you know they don't have lines and what I'm finding is it makes it a lot more difficult to wrap up the uh, the SGU storyline with Destiny um, which is what I really wanted to do and I've read several different iterations of people's ideas, their scripts, their, you know, stories of how that, that happens. And I've been reading the, uh, the new comic that is supposedly supposed to like continue or wrap it up or whatever. Uh, but I really, I had my own idea and it would be based on like the main thing is the Lucian Alliance, um, going to war with earth and taking it over basically. And then, uh, you know, this new team would need to go, would be sent back in time using a solar flare like what happens in SG-1 on the episode 1969. And uh, they would need to not necessarily fix the timeline, but change it. And it wouldn't change anything that we saw in the movies or the shows. It would go right up to the end of SGU. Uh, and then that's where it would begin to be different from what I originally um, envisioned. And then it would, at the same time, be laying ground for new stories if people wanted more. So I, I have about four 10-minute episodes in audio drama form planned. And I, as of last night, I have uh, two and a half written because um, I, I write these pretty fast, but then I'll, I'll take the time to go through them, edit them. And they're, they're pretty short, pretty easy. But the main thing I'm finding that's really difficult is how do I wrap up the Destiny storyline or continue it while not using any of those characters? So I might have to change my idea. That's why I want to write them really, really quickly, see what I wrote, you know, if it works or not, and then backtrack and work from there. And that's kind of what I did with A Call of Duty Unity. I, I wrote uh, 10 scripts in just a couple weeks um, to see, okay, this is my story. Does it work? What do I need to change? Now, do you um, do you give anybody sneak peeks of the the written version to see if they have any input, or do you just write it and then let it sit for a while and then go back and read it yourself with fresh eyes? Yeah, uh, for these these fan uh, fan films or fan audio dramas or whatever, uh, I I write them. I might sit on them for a little bit. I'll go through them, edit them a little bit, and then I might have people take a look but usually it's it's just me um my my other projects that aren't fan related like my my original comic book that's upcoming uh i have a great editor he uh you know he will read through it and give me feedback and then i'll go through and keep editing and send it back to him back and forth Uh, so he uh he will see it basically from the first draft or so on Whereas with this fan stuff, it's just basically me. I have my girlfriend read through them pretty quick. You know, just to be like, oh, you, you know, you misspelled that or whatever. Or like, yeah, that works, that doesn't. Uh, but other than that, it's basically me. 
shout outs to your uh, cast of performers who's doing what and uh, who do you need to crack the whip on to get them to do more <laughs> no they're, they're all they're all fantastic uh, they they're pretty good about getting me lines uh, they do a great job and you know these are all people that that are fans of Star Trek and they really love it and it's been really fun working with them because what I, I just you know I'm like here's the script you know, record three different versions of the line, uh, send it back to me, you know, by this, you know, by the end of this month or whatever. Usually I give them at least a month uh, to record. Uh, and, you know, it's been drama free, which is great. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why they, they, they like it um, is because it's, you know, I, I try to be easy to work with. Because uh, you know, I know that they're taking time out of their lives to contribute to this, and you know they don't get paid. This is on their own time, so I, I try to make it fun and engaging, and uh, you know, hopefully they enjoy the story. Um, if they don't, they haven't said anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the problem. Is it's basically me, you know, sitting on these scripts. Is I'm like, oh, I enjoy that. Oh, that's cool. You know, I don't actually know if anyone's like, oh man, that's just the most dumb thing ever. But you know, I try to get their feedback when I when I send it to them, and usually it's 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 pretty positive. And none of them have been like, oh, that's no, don't do that. So you know, I it if it might be slightly surprising if someone on YouTube comments on it and is like, oh, that's stupid. I'll be like, oh, I didn't know that. No one said anything. Now, do your uh, does your voice talent uh, do they have a little leeway as far as line delivery, or is it did they stick to the script? Is there any ad libbing uh, or improving that works its so way in? A couple people will will be like, you know, I have I have a I have some ideas on this line, or I want to switch around these sentences because I'm I I'm pretty famous for accidentally putting my sentences. Um, like in the wrong order of what would make sense logically. Uh, and so they're pretty good about, you know, telling me, Hey, this needs to be different, you know, or can I try this instead? And I'm, and usually I think 99% of the time I'm like, yeah, go for it. Uh, is it, you know, if it makes the story better, Hey, that's great. Cause I realize that, you know, I, I have flaws in my writing and how I think, what I do and you know someone will approach it differently and if they have a better idea that's great I don't mind it's not like no 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 you can't do that this is my stuff no 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 I'm not like that I'm not at the very least not with this fan stuff because you know that's what it is it's a it's a fan project um, I'm a fan I'm a rabid fan who who enjoys Star Trek and uh, so if it makes the story better that's great lightning round time Video killed the radio star, but who shot Liberty Valance? Hans Zimmer. <laughs> you know that Hans Zimmer, uh, he was he was a part of who sh you know uh, radio killed the uh, uh, oh wait sorry video killed the radio star. That was his thing. Yeah. Which I don't think a lot of people realize. Like, he, sorry, I know this is lightning round, but like he's a really talented composer and. He just everything he gets his hand into is is awesome. Yep. Next question, please. Next question. All right. Um. Well, since you've brought him up, Star Wars versus Star uh, Star Trek versus Stargate, who wins? Oh, uh, I would say Star Trek. I I like Star Trek way before I like Stargate. Uh, but Stargate has a special place in my heart. Um, but well, Star, I... Star Trek always wins. All right, well, let me put it this way. Uh, Star Trek away team versus uh, Stargate uh, SG team who wins in a combat scenario. Well, you know, <laughs> the away team will have phasers. And SG-1, you know, they have, like, P-90s. So, and, you know, although, you know, Tilk has his staff weapon. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think it would have to be the, the away team. Yeah, Although, tricky. you know, they do have MacGyver on it. Yeah, they have MacGyver and they have Zats, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, Star that's true. Like, Trekkie Star Trek always wins. Reser, 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 Reser. <laughs> Lursa or Bator? Oh, man. Oh, I I can't have both. You don't want either one. They're going to kill you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, They're you're evil. right. I don't want either one. 
<laughs> Neither. Okay. So you want both? What? You really, really got a death wish? <laughs> they stab you in the back and then turn around so they can stab you in the back of your back, which I'm is your I'm just going to have to read a lot of poetry to them. Well, you know, I forgot a very important question. What class starship is uh, featured in your... Oh, yeah. Okay. So that that's a really good question. Unity is... Well, that's the name of the ship, is Unity. And uh, right. it's an original ship. Uh, it's... Um, you know, I'm trying to remember because I don't really need to think about this a whole lot, but I believe it's a Union class vessel. Um, it's more like a, kind of a science vessel, but it, it's not quite that. Um, Andre Kotman is actually designing uh, the Unity for me uh, for the last several months, and it it's going to be awesome. Uh, again, surprises. I'm hoping to reveal it. Uh, you know, around episode one, it really depends on, you know, what Andre's finished because he's taking his time, you know, out, you know, out of his day, you know, after work, of course, to work on this. And I, I mean, you know, I really appreciate that because, you know, he, no one's getting paid. I can't pay anyone because of the guidelines unless right. someone wants to fight me on that. <laughs> uh, you know, I wish I could. I want to pay people. Um, partly, I don't have the money to do that. Uh, right. But everyone works really hard and I really wish I could. Now, just to continue with the theme of uh, unity and coming together, is this a uh, uh, is it going to be like a hybrid design? It looks part Federation, part Romulan, or part Federation, part Vulcan, or is no, it? No, it's it's Federation. Unity is 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 Federation. Yeah, the theme is is coming together uh, between you know the Vulcans, Romulans, and the Federation and the Klingons, you know, working together. Uh, you know, hence the name, a call to unity. Because uh, they have to come together to stop this this ancient threat that uh, that threatens all of them. Uh, so I can't, I can't even remember what your question was. That's the problem. Now I have to actually give answers. I can't remember what the question <laughs> is. Man, this is really difficult. Uh, you answered it. It's not a hybrid design. Okay. It doesn't yeah. lift elements from. No, I I think hybrid ships can be cool, but. It, I think I think Star Trek Online did that, didn't they? They have hybrid ships. Maybe they have not. a they have a couple that have a, a look about them, but okay. yeah, they're. I, I think that's interesting, but I don't really go for that. Okay, so you're 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 a Federation purist. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's our show for today, kids. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Mullen, for attending and interviewing today. Of course. Be sure to check out A Call to Unity on YouTube. We'll try to include a link at the bottom of this podcast. It's also on iTunes. It is on iTunes, too, it took on a YouTube. While. Yeah, it's, yeah, it took a while to get it on there, but it, it's on there. All right. Download it from iTunes. Find it on YouTube. And this has been The Final Frontier, a Trexphere podcast. Follow us on Facebook and uh, check us out on YouTube and in the iTunes store. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, grab your gun and bring the cat in. <laughs>